Today on The Nation Speaks. Are there people in your life it's impossible to talk to about politics? Braver Angels is here to help. Randy Leah says it might be possible to disagree without needing to win. Then in America Q&A we ask, whatever you think about the validity of the 2020 election, can you imagine changing your mind if you saw strong evidence on the other side? Next, we hear there's a childcare crisis in America, but what does that mean? Tom Copeland can tell us. He's worked in the industry for over 40 years. Finally, in our second America Q&A, we ask, as of today, what are your top issues in deciding who to vote for? Hello and welcome to The Nation Speaks. I'm your host, Cindy Drewcare. Have you ever had a frustrating, go-nowhere political conversation with someone on the other side of the red-blue divide? And has it gotten worse since 2016? That's what the founders of Braver Angels noticed and decided America needed some help. As they say on their website, Americans no longer see their political opponents as simply wrong or misguided. They see them as enemies who must be defeated at all costs. We do not accept this. We reject the normalizing of this extreme polarization. Here to tell us how to depolarize political conversations and rebuild civic trust is Braver Angels Director of Events, Randy Lias. Randy, thank you so much for coming. Thanks so much for having me, Cindy. Start out by giving us the 30,000 foot overview of what Braver Angels is and trying to accomplish. Well, we're one of the nation's largest nonprofits focused on depolarizing America. So we recognize that a lot of people are having very difficult time talking with folks on the other side about what they believe and really maintaining those connections. A lot of, uh, a lot of relationships have really been uh, torn asunder by the last few years, and we want to help people be able to communicate better and rescue those relationships and be able to understand how one another got to what they believe. I know you do a variety of things. You coach people or have trainings on one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, on campuses and the workplace and in politics. So all that is very exciting. Could you, and I know all of them have a similar sort of philosophy or approach that they bring to the table. So can you explain what that is? Yeah, so our underlying philosophy is that Curiosity is really the best approach for these conversations. You know, the, the first thing that we mention when someone comes to our red blue workshop, which is the bread and butter of what we do, it, it brings equal numbers of reds and blues to the table to talk about what they believe. And that first rule is nobody is here to change anybody else's mind. We are here to understand one another and we're here to find common ground where it exists. And we think that a lot of people underappreciate how much common ground there is between us. That was one of the things that really impressed me. I know your, your first session like this was in Ohio, I guess, shortly after the election in 2016. And the participants there talked about, you know, finding this humanity and realizing that they had more in common than they ever kind of imagined possible. And importantly, more than the media reflects back to us. And there seemed to be a bit of animosity about the media, you know, reflecting a much more polarized America than really exists. Is, has this been your common experience? Well, it's certainly true that the current media environment contributes a lot to our polarization and makes us believe that there's really just two teams and you have to pick one of those teams and be really loyal to, uh, to the, the talking points and to the leaders of your chosen side. And we really like to bring people together to kind of explode those notions and show people that uh, each side is not a monolith, that it's likely that you're gonna have, you're gonna share a lot of your values and your beliefs with folks on the other side. So I've moderated a lot of workshops and I think without fail at each one of them, someone has said at the end that they're a lot closer to those folks on the other side than they realized. It's, it's really about bringing people together to uh, disabuse them of those stereotypes that they have, that everyone from the other side thinks a certain way and that they have to be monolithic in their, in their views with you know, those, those folks who identify with a similar, similar label as them. Uh, otherwise, they would be accused of being disloyal or being naive, being misled by the other side. 
Can you get concrete for us and describe how these sessions go, what questions are put towards the group, what they're asked to discuss? Right. Well, at this point, we have over 40 workshop formats, but the Red Blue Workshop is still, I think, one of the most meaningful experiences that someone can have with our organization. And so with at the beginning of that workshop, we start off with a stereotypes exercise that asks them a few questions about their own group and, and about how the other side sees them. So first we say, well, how do you think, what are the stereotypes that the other side has of your group? So, uh, you know, the, the blues will say, well, the, the reds think that we're bleeding heart liberals, that we don't care about uh, fiscal responsibility, that we're open borders, things like that. The reds will say, well, the blues, the blues think that we're racist and that we are uh, misogynistic and that we're Bible thumpers, things, things like that. So then they have a chance to analyze those stereotypes and say, well, this is what we really represent. This is the reality of the situation. And we'd like the other side to understand us a little bit better. But one of the other really powerful aspects of this exercise is that there is a kernel of truth generally about stereotypes that we ask these groups to uh, to recognize. And we say, is there something in your past? Is there a small but vocal minority that makes it appear that this is the character of your group? Uh, and when each side is, is very reflective about you know how their group is approaching issues and and coming across uh, it, it's really powerful it helps to build goodwill between the two sides and really helps them to open up to one another and to fully understand one another child care is in crisis across america centers are closing because they can't find staff or keep them meanwhile families can't find open spots or ones they can afford there are a lot of anecdotal stories to support this and there are some studies too, but coming up with concrete stats, like with many things, isn't easy. The American Enterprise Institute examined a lot of surveys and found problems with methodology, conflicting results, and dynamics that were underappreciated, like why working women aren't coming back to the labor force. So rather than delve into all of this, we invited our next guest to give us a hands-on view of the issue. With us now is Tom Copeland. He is an expert in the business of family child care, working in the space for over 40 years as a trainer, advocate, and the author of nine books. He's crisscrossed the country and knows a thing or two about how all of this works. Tom, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Tom, is there a crisis in child care in America? There's always been a child care crisis uh, for decades. Uh, parents can't afford to pay what providers uh, need to live on. And that has always been the case. And we've always had a problem of low quality care and people leaving the childcare field because they're not earning enough money. The pandemic has exacerbated this uh, across the board. And uh, it's meant that childcare providers have left the field, they've retired or they've quit, they've moved on to other jobs that pay more. Uh, they've closed down their business because they they got COVID. It's just, it's gotten worse during the pandemic. Is it something that's permanent because people have left the industry and closed that it won't bounce back? In this new environment, it may mean that more parents are working at home and therefore need uh, fewer hours of childcare during their week. But <laughs> women aren't going back into the home and, and are not going to be working. So there's always going to be a need for child care. Does that mean it's going to be met by the current system of child care centers and licensed or regulated family child care providers? Or are we going to see more unregulated, illegal uh, child care programs spring up to meet the need? Or is government going to come in and uh, establish more government-run child care programs? That's hard to say at this point but the need for childcare is not gonna go away.